Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our, you know, Agico market update uh, for the month of April. Today we have Mark Welch. Uh, he's going to talk about. Uh, he, he's going to give us about an outlook about grains. John Robinson. He's going to give us an outlook about uh, cotton. And lay, last, David Anderson, who is going to give us uh, an outlook on livestock. Um, John, do you want to start first? Yeah. Is that okay with you? Yeah. If you want to share your slides. Remember, anyone who has any questions, just, you know, ask as questions as you want, as many as you want. If you can't do it, you can also write them in the chat and, and I will, you know, um, and, and we will read them. Okay. Pancho, does this look okay? I can see your second monitor, the one that shows, you know, what the next slide is going to be, not. Okay, let me, how about that? I still see your second monitor. That's okay. I'm not sure how to, <laughs> how to alter that. Um, and now I see myself. If not, just. If you want to work it like that, yeah, we, we can see it anyway. Okay, I'll do it like that, John. All right, I'll just work with it this way, not to take more time. So um, here's a here's a picture of cotton prices. The blue line is is last year's crop, which is in storage, being sold. Um, it's the futures are in the low 80s, and the, this coming season's crop in red is also trading in the low 80s. In a sense, that's not surprising uh, because if you look at the very bottom number of this column and this column, the third and fourth columns, you know, the supply and demand outcome is pretty much the same. At least USDA is projecting, you know, four million bales, mazomenos of ending stocks for the 22 crop, and they're projecting ahead for the same outcome. And so when we have similar supply and demand outcomes, we expect similar price ranges. Now there's always uncertainty that can happen. That'll change, change the outcome and change the price behavior. So let's just look at some of those possibilities for the old crop. Um, situation there, there are some competing views of of things that might deviate a little bit from the normal supply and demand influence. Uh, one is uh, up here, what USDA refers to as unusual inventory dynamics. What, what they mean by that is during COVID, everything got screwed up. A lot of the shipping got screwed up. We had excess yarn stocks and, and transportation was messed up. And so as things get back to normal, uh, we actually found some um, kind of some shortages of yarn, which the market is now trying to make up for. So there's 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 more demand than there would be uh, because of trying to because of pent up demand following COVID disruption. Uh, another thing that's been going on is that um, the price of cotton, these 80 cent prices of cotton really seem a little bit low, but they're artificially low, at least in the sense that there's a lot of speculators out there who've been making bets that the market was going to go down and they're they're they've sold the market and just their just their positioning, their selling has kept cotton prices pretty low. And so there is one school of thought out there that, well, these artificially low prices and these pent up demands are going to bring a whole lot of buying coming. These these people have been talking about it mostly on Twitter for a while. They're expecting China to enter the market and buy like a million bales of cotton at these low prices. That hadn't happened yet. Um, here's we've had some pretty deep. If you look on the right hand side of the blue peaks and valleys over here, we've had some we modest, OK, export sales numbers. Uh, they haven't been as high as I thought they'd be, given how low prices are. But but the bullish argument is expecting a lot more of this and a lot better, you know, a surge 
in demand. Again, hadn't happened yet, but if it did, it would probably trigger a, a what I'd call a fundamental price rally. If, if the market saw booming export sales, this this these low prices would uh, would come up. And if that was to happen, if they were to come up, that in turn would trigger uh, what what the market traders call short covering. Because right now, if you look at this green um, this green area that's pointed down, what that mean, what that reflects is the short position of the hedge funds, the people that bet on futures prices and follow the trends and f follow computer buy and sell signals. Those those people more of them have sold the market expecting it to go down well if the market goes up these people are going to get scared and they're going to buy their way out they're going to buy back all these positions and if that happens you can look over here the last time that happened it, it they can induce a rally they can induce a five or ten cent rally in the market you know like when this goes away and when that goes away and when that goes away that always triggers rallies so again if we have if we have some fundamental reason for the prices to go up they could go shooting up and these people would be gasoline on the fire now that's that hadn't happened yet and there are some people that think it won't happen because uh, they're looking at the market and they're looking at the broader economy and they're saying you know the the federal reserve is not through raising interest rates and that's recessionary they're going to do that some more and these people expect recessionary pressures to squelch any any of this other stuff from going on. And if for those of you who follow Twitter, this 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 difference of opinion between the first three bullets here and the bottom point are being uh, kind of pushed and argued and in a kind of a knife fight that's going on on Twitter between this gentleman <laughs> who goes by Cotton Pancho Villa and he's talking to this other guy, Cotton Zapata, who uh, Cotton Zapata is very, very bullish. He's the one that thinks that prices are going to go shooting up. And Pancho Villa thinks that uh, prices are going to be squelched by by the recession. So if, if y'all are on Twitter and you're kind of interested in seeing an unfolding cotton market discussion, you can you can read what these guys are writing to each other. I personally don't I'm not sure which I mean, either one could happen. It's uncertain. It's uncertain. So. You know, I'm not going to insult anybody. I'm just going to say that there, there's various possibilities that could play out. But th there is at least one one possibility for near term prices to bounce up, you know, five or ten cents from where they are in the low 80s. OK, that's enough of the old crop deal. I'll wrap up talking about the new crop. Uh, we've got some um, sense of how big or how small the new crop crop size might be based on planted acreage. Most of the planted acreages that have been published survey work uh, have been higher than I expected, certainly. They've been somewhere around 11 million acres planted. Uh, the last report we had at the end of March was 11 and a quarter million acres planted. We've got another planted acreage report coming out in June. If we have 11 and a quarter or just 11 million planted, even though it's dry, you know, if you plant 11 million acres all across the belt, we'll have a we'll have enough cotton kind of to take the edge off of fears of a shortage. And and so I I think the way it's playing out, if it plays out according to USDA's current predictions, we're going to basically have another year of having about four point something million bales of ending stocks, which to my way of thinking ought to keep us keep prices from taking off like a rocket probably keep us in the 80s maybe as we get on to harvest time we could have prices trade in the in the lower to mid 80s maybe try or make a run at the upper 80s and then slide below 80 cents if we follow the path of the kinds of years that USDA at least is suggesting that we're in now if we have a severe shortage of production and if demand recovers strongly we might find ourselves on this path these are the kind of years when that's happened before. So again, we'll have to see. I, I think this is probably the most likely, uh, given the number of different things that could get end up giving us this supply and demand outcome. So, um, a lot of uncertainty in the cotton market. We'll just have to see how it 
how it plays out. And Pancho, that's uh, that's all I've got. You're muted, Pancho. Thank you, John. Great presentation. Hey, do uh, anyone has a question for John? John, are you going to say a little later? Mark, whenever you want to start. All right. Uh, appreciate it, Pancho. Thanks for. Uh pulling all this together for us. Always good to be with you. Hope you can see those slides okay, and you can just uh, jump in and let me know if there's a, a problem with the presentation. Uh, I'm going to touch on a few other themes that uh, that Dr. Robinson was just talking about in the cotton market, of course, that uh, are going to fix our, our grain outlook as well. And of course, uh, this is the slide we, we've seen many times at the beginning of these presentations of all those supply and demand factors that kind of shape where our grain prices are headed. But we haven't received a lot of clarity around some of these issues. At least we have some information around intentions. And I'm going to focus my, my comments uh, this morning primarily on the perspective plannings report and the impact that these changing expectations around planted area could have on our price prospects, particularly for wheat and then looking at the corn market. If you look at these uh, six major crops planted in the United States, and this chart goes back to 1929, uh, our our planted acres intended for 2023 for these six crops total just over 249 million acres. That's a 5.1 million acre increase from last year. Uh, is the increase primarily from the corn and wheat markets. There's a 7.5 million acres uh, right there. Uh, the reduction in cotton acres uh, relative to last year, small decline in sorghum, very small increase in soybeans. But I think what's interesting about this chart is if you look at that increase here for 2023, the last time we saw this high of a total of these six crops combined, go back to 2013, 2014, 2015. Again, that was the previous era of record high prices. And I think we're seeing the impact, the incentive that these high prices have to increase supply, to increase production. These are market signals that farmers in the US are intending to respond to. And, and certainly I think that response will be seen globally uh, as farmers have the, uh, the capacity and the ability and the resources to uh, increase production in 2023, given the uh, strong price signals we're seeing in our grain markets. Looking a little bit specifically, this is what all U.S. wheat acres look like in 2023 compared to our plantings going back uh, over 100 years. That would be uh, that 49.9 million acres. Uh, gets us back to the most plantings of wheat we've had since 2016. Yeah, that's our all wheat acres. If you look at winter wheat acres, the highest since 2015, uh, 37.5 million acres. Uh, in Texas, uh, we're seeing the highest uh, planted acres in almost 30 years. Uh, so obviously, again, uh, with the, the opportunity to respond to these higher prices. However, uh, that's all wheat, that's winter wheat. Uh, the spring wheat situation doesn't look quite the same, and we'll look at that in just a second. That's our winter wheat acre uh, planted. What about the production prospects off of those acres? Uh, the drought monitor focusing on the southern plains. Uh, if you compare what it looked like back in January to the map that was re re released last week, uh, the situation has just gotten worse. Uh, primarily, if you look at the top wheat producing counties in the country, which are right along the border between uh, northern Oklahoma and southern Kansas. Uh, they've been in these extreme, exceptional drought conditions uh, this entire growing season. And so even with the increase in acres, looking for an increase in production possibilities from this part of the world certainly look greatly diminished, uh, considering the, the broad area that continues under these severe drought conditions and, and the, uh, 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 the length of time uh, that, that they've suffered under these. So even some, some moisture that we were to get, say, here in late spring as we uh, try to maturing the crop, there's certainly going to be a, a very limited benefit uh, given the depth and the breadth of the drought that they've been in for, for this entire growing season. So that's kind of the, the winter wheat crop. Spring wheat acres, the lowest since 1972 at 10.6 million acres. Uh, quite, a, quite a shift there when you look at the other competition of other crops 
uh, in the spring wheat country. Uh, of course, wheat prices are down somewhat this year compared to a year ago. Uh, in much of the spring wheat country, they have the ability to plant corn. They can plant soybeans. And, and so there's uh, the competition for acres, I think, is uh, certainly still going to play out as we look at the uh, uh, where we're planting our, our spring wheat crop. And again, this just highlights the degree to which if, if we either don't get the yield or we don't get these acres planted, uh, again, this could be a, a, a significant area of deficiency in U.S. wheat production this year. We've already got acres down to the lowest in 50 years, and there's no guarantee we're going to get that, that 10.6 million. And that's where I kind of want to go with this chart. Those prospective plantings report that came out on March the 31st, on April the 1st, this is the snow depth chart from the Dakotas across Minnesota. Uh, anywhere there's blue on them, that map, there's a considerable bit of snow. And as you get to these darker blue areas, you can see we move from four to 10 to 20 inches of snow pretty quickly. Uh, and so the, the immediately following that report, uh, there was a lot of snow on the ground up in this part of the world. The snow depth as of two weeks later was, was looking much diminished. However, still uh, quite a bit of the uh, eastern half of North Dakota still sowing, showing a, a significant area covered by snow. Now, they plant wheat pretty well across the entire state of North Dakota. Their corn production is focused primarily in the eastern half. And that's going to matter a lot here in just a minute as we uh, talk a little bit about the corn market. But if you look at where uh, that uh, area of wheat is still a concern of getting that crop planted, uh, and that's if we get the 10.5 million. And if it continues to say wet, continues to say cold, uh, any indication we're not going to get those acres could have a significant impact on our wheat market. If we do get the, those acres planted that came out in the prospective plantings report, what I've done is I've taken the uh, outlook that USDA presented back in February at the Outlook Forum, adjusted those numbers with these prospective planning numbers for 2023, and some minor adjustments in the April WASD and the planted acres based on the prospective planning report, are up about 400,000 compared to where they were back in February. That would mean about 300,000 more acres harvested at a national average yield. That only increases production, about 16 million bushels. Just some changing use estimates from the old crop year gave us another 30 million bushels of wheat. If we were to increase that kind of supply by about 46 million year over year, holding total use about the same, that would change that ending stock estimate relative to use or our days of use on hand at the end of the marketing year from a 113 day supply of wheat to about 120, 121. What does that do to our price outlook if we were to see that increase in supply relative to use? If you look at that relationship going back over the last 15 or 20 years, as our days of use on hand, of course, as that increases, that puts a downward pressure on the season average farm price or the national average price received by farmers. Here's USDA's estimate for 2022, and these are adjusted for inflation, uh, by the way, so those aren't actually nominal prices. These are 2022 prices. Uh, if you see the, uh, the 2022 price, 116-day carryover keeps us kind of in the same ballpark. If we increase that carryover to 120, 121 days, it does pull us down from, say, 850 to eight and a quarter but still in this relatively high $8 a bushel range for a national season average farm price. Some downward pressure on prices, but, uh, but yet relatively moderate compared to, the, to uh, the price activity that we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years. However, that's strongly dependent on getting those acres planted, particularly the vulnerability we have with the low area of spring wheat uh, that uh, the prospective plantings was historically low, and then whether we even get planted up to that low area, combine that with uh, the very difficult situations in, in the hard red winter wheat country of uh, the yield potential and the harvested acres that are going to come out of that the significant area of, uh, of wheat production. Uh, again, those factors will have to come into play to push that number down. And I think there's a lot of question and uncertainty whether those, those actually play out. If you look at the corn market very quickly. Uh, the prospective plantings report showed an indication of increasing corn acres around the country. Looking at the I states, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, there's 650,000 acres. Uh, the other corn belt acres, five areas, 550,000 acres. You look across the south from Texas to, uh, to the Carolinas, 865,000 acres. 
and just the Dakotas alone, almost a million acre increase compared to a year before. Where did those spring wheat acres go? They went to corn. What is the likelihood we're going to get that corn planted? Given the degree to which uh, so much of the state, primarily their primary corn producing areas, are still under snow as we're uh, heading into late April, I think it raises a real question of whether we get those acres or not. If we get them, if we get that million acres at the national average yield, that would increase production this year, uh, in 2023 by about 160 million bushels compared to a year ago. Some lower demand and, and use numbers from last marketing year raised that total supply about 235 million acres. If our use numbers do not change from what USDA was projecting back in February, that raises our carryover relative to, uh, to use in terms of days of use on hand from a 48-day supply to a 54-day supply. Now, that's only six days. But if USDA is correct, and these numbers were to play out, we're moving from here's your 22 carryover and, and prices. There's what a 47-day carryover looks like. There's what a 53-day carryover looks like. That would put significant downward pressure on prices if we move below this, this 40-day threshold. That, that's really a critical point when we get to the corn market. So when we look about our production estimates and our use uh, categories as we go into the new marketing year, uh, will we move to this degree or not? A million acres matters, and it matters a lot. And so, again, I think the market's going to watch very closely how these uh, factors play out over the next couple of months. This report comes out every Monday afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, watch for the crop progress report. It will give us some indication, are we on track to getting the corn crop in the ground and then the spring wheat crop in the ground? North Dakota is the largest producer. It's early yet, but watch those average planted numbers relative with what's getting planted week to week. That's going to provide some, some key market indicators around those supply uh, measures that we were just looking at a few minutes ago. The likelihood of seeing those acres, we've already historically low on spring wheat. Are we going to get them? We're calling for an increase in corn. Are we going to get those? Again, folks up in that part of the world can plant soybeans too. They plant a lot of them. Is that, does that become the next default crop? Can't get the wheat in, can't get the corn in. Uh, can you get a soybean crop planted on time? Again, I think uh, watching for Monday afternoon uh, market reaction to these crop progress is going to be very, very important. So that's what I'm about to share today. Uh, again, nothing's really changed in terms of my overall outlook for 2023. I'm looking for an increase in supply relative to use, which is going to put some moderate downward pressure on our grain prices, corn, grain sorghum, and wheat. But obviously, so much depends on, on the weather outlook, getting the crop planted this, this spring, as well as. Uh, the continued influence of the global economy, global trade. There, there's more uncertainty out of the, the Black Sea region even this week. That turmoil is going to stay with us. Uh, but uh, so many factors to watch. But again, uh, th those Monday afternoon reports are going to get a lot of attention. Uh, let's see how we get this this crop planted as we go to get a spring wheat crop in the ground, as well as uh, how much corn gets planted and the continued drought prospects for the Southern Plains. Pancho, appreciate it. Uh, it's what I brought to share today, and I will uh, turn it back over to you. Mark, great presentation. Thank you very much. Do you all have any questions for Mark? If not, Dave, sorry. And I'm trying to get off of here. Hang on just a second. I'll get. And I should. All right. Excellent. All yours. David, whenever you want to share yours. Great. Got it. Yeah. Fantastic. I'll tell you what, I undersold the title here. I just called it livestock market when I should have put in all bold caps and exclamation points or record prices. And in fact, I'm just going to talk about the cattle market today. Uh, I think there's a bunch of other interesting things happening in some of our other livestock markets, uh, whether we're you know talking lamb or hogs or or uh, or eggs for that matter i continue to get phone calls about eggs but i'll leave those for questions and maybe next month's update but you know when we got record highs record high cattle prices going on i figure that's probably what we ought to talk about and so i'm going to i want to do two things with this let me go back to prices i'm going to i'm going to show several price charts talk about these record prices that we have happening and why and then uh 
I'm going to go into a couple of things on what I'm going to call price spreads or some gross margins, our live to cut out that we saw so much of, you know, following the pandemic with really record profits, record returns to meat packers. Uh, and so I want I want to show a chart of that. I want to show some charts of, of returns, both cow-calf, feedlot, that idea of sort of that gross margin type notion on the for packers, but also for retailers and retail beef price. So that's where I'm headed with this, and we'll kind of hit some of these things. You know, heck, three weeks in a row of record high cattle prices, and, and I'm going to use the five markets, slaughter steer. These are fed cattle. Uh, we actually, looks like we're going to average over 180 for last week. Uh, I did some quick calculations before the re before the actual a number from USDA comes out, but you know we're going to push 182, 183 for the average price last week. Uh, there were certainly cattle that sold at that up in in the northern plains. Uh, we were over 175 in the southern plains, you know Texas, Oklahoma, but certainly record high prices uh, for I guess the third week in a row. We've had some one of our markets hit record highs. You know if we went back to Late in 2014, the old weekly average record was 172. Uh, so we've we've certainly surpassed that. And and really, what's happening is tighter supplies. Beef production so far this year is down four and a half percent. It's coming from a couple of areas. One is a lot fewer beef cows are going to market. You know, maybe we did a lot of the hard work calling last year. And we've just plain got fewer going uh, so far this year. But the other part is is steer slaughter is below a year ago, and weights are lower. Fed cattle weights are lower, whether we're talking steers or heifers. And so uh, we're really getting uh, less beef production. About again, like I said, about four and a half percent less beef. Uh, yet, you know, really, what? What takes us to these kinds of heights is really, I think we have to argue that we continue to have very good demand for beef from the consumer, that that everything we see in the marketplace so far, you know, the 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 effect the work of the Federal Reserve to try to bring inflation under control while we're seeing lower prices, the CPI is lower, the rate of growth in that is lower. Uh, folks are still buying beef. We have not yet seen a big demand reduction yet. And so we continue to have very good demand for beef. We have very good demand for cattle from meat packers. And so as our supplies are tightening, you know, prices are going up. In fact, and, and I, you know, I'll certainly say prices are higher than I expected them to be. If you'd asked me a couple months ago, heck, if you'd asked me three weeks ago, are we going to 185 for fed cattle? I said, I think it's premature. I thought we would get there by next year as we think about seasonal prices as tight as supplies tighten up more. But, you know, the demand is there and it's showing up in cattle prices. Uh, I'm going to show three price charts. Here's some four to five hundred pound number one steers, you know, southern plains. Texas and Oklahoma, uh, certainly, you know, lighter weight calves are showing that uh increase in prices. I was glad Mark showed that chart with, you know, $2 per bushel lower corn prices. You know, if those kinds of planted acres and yields show up, uh, I had been factoring in something like a dollar or so. Uh, but that thing would, you know, certainly if if that comes to fruition and lower uh, feed prices, that provides some more room for our calf prices, but certainly higher four to 500 pound, five to sixes, uh, it, you know, up in the in the 240s is an average price. Uh, you know, heck, let me go back one. Some of y'all may have seen some auction prices, I think, from Iowa where they had $3 calves. Uh, now, they were pretty light. They were about 400 pounds, but, but certainly some skyrocketing prices. And if we go to fed cattle, they have really taken off. And, you know, really the combination of, of some lower feed costs, but but really these really skyrocketing fed cattle prices. Now, if you looked at the futures market, and, and I'm, I will admit, I didn't look this morning uh, before this. I was in another meeting and didn't really have time to look. But, you know, on Friday, when we closed on Friday, if we look at, at fed cattle prices out in later this year, we were still in the low 260s. 
by 2024, we had some 270s on the, the Fed cattle futures. Um, you know, certainly we're not, we're sure not up to what we're seeing in the cash market now. Uh, but, and, and quite honestly, if we kind of mark those forward and put in some, some cost of gain, uh, cost of feeding, some break evens, you know, at these kinds of feeder cattle prices, it's pretty tough to make those break even where the futures market has been, unless we see a pretty big rally in that. But, but I think the point is, you know, we're pulling these cattle prices higher based on higher fed cattle profit, higher fed cattle uh, prices, uh, some positive current returns in cattle feeding, and the prospects for lower feed costs are really pushing these things higher against the backdrop of just plain fewer animals. Uh, with a couple of years now of declining cow herd, uh, fewer cows, fewer calves, fewer cattle on the market, yet the demand is there. And so, uh, you know, that's really pulling these prices higher and higher. Uh, you know, I wanted to show this notion of, of kind of that expectation of, say, fed cattle profits uh, going forward. And, and so what I do here is just a simple feeder steer minus fed steer price. Uh, implying that buy sell margin between the feeders and feds. Uh, and what you'll notice is there's certainly a seasonal pattern to that. Yet over the last about two months, we're well above that kind of seasonal pattern. What that su su should suggest to us is that feeder cattle prices, uh, as, as that gap widens, it's tougher to make those work profit wise. Uh, and so uh, but we certainly, it just shows that certainly we're bidding higher and higher feeder cattle prices uh, into the market, reflecting a higher fed steer and lower feed cost environment going forward. And so, you know, I think that's worth thinking about in terms of can we, can we really keep that spread this wide or wider going forward for a long term? That's pretty tough to do. And so I think that's worth, uh, you know, keeping in mind. Uh, I, I thought I would include the cutout. Uh, last week's cutout averaged about 297 or eight. Um, by the end of the week, we were at $3.02 a pound or three, $302 per hundred weight uh, on the choice beef carcass with a choice select spread about 18 to $19. So, you know, we are seeing the effects, I think, of higher cattle prices showing up in the higher cutout value or wholesale value, the box beef cutout value, but that the live prices are are increasing faster than certainly the wholesale market is. Uh, so, you know, all of these things are sort of moving together, but not as much strength in the wholesale market as we see in the in the uh, uh, live market. Let me say something about these spreads and returns. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, th I think the main thing to remember across when I show this live to cut out, cut out to retail is it's just the difference in buying the live cattle and selling the beef, buying the wholesale beef and selling the retail beef at average prices. So it doesn't have their costs taken out. And I think that's really important to keep in mind that there are costs associated with capturing that. But, you know, now, you know, I want to point that out for the future, but, you know, for a couple of slides from now, but let's look at a couple of these. I've, I've got some estimated cow-calf returns, and I've projected those out 23 and 24 based on some estimated costs. Uh, calf prices where we're going, and and I would I would point out that we're back in some positive territory for 22, 23, 24, yet you know, my my prices that I'm using here for calf prices are not as high as what we're seeing in the market today. So I think there's still some opportunity for that we will see these estimates grow. And why I think that's important is we're setting the stage for, you know, getting pasture recovery, drought recovery, lower costs. We're really setting the stage for if we have drought recovery, there are positive returns to cow-calf production to drive herd expansion in the future. Now, the other thing I would point out is we're nowhere near where we were in 14 and 15 in terms of those at that time record high prices, but also much lower costs. If I was gonna look at some cattle feeding returns, 
Again, estimated cattle feeding returns. Uh, boy, these things are really uh, boosted in the last couple of months by increasing fed cattle prices, uh, some falling feed costs. And so we really have about six or seven months there of positive returns. And I'll tell you what, you know, some, two, some, some 180, 185 uh, uh, fed cattle prices, those are going to look tremendous as I mark some of these forward in some coming months. But again, there's profits here too. And those profits are contributing to bidding those feeder cattle prices up. Let's jump to kind of the next stage if we were looking at the live to cutout spread. Again, implying that packer margin. Again, it doesn't have packer costs taken out, but look where we are now. We're at about 260, uh, lower than last year, certainly lower than the five-year average. Uh, but when we talk about packer profits, what we see here is this margin really being squeezed by rapidly increasing fed cattle prices uh, and wholesale prices that have not advanced like that. So we certainly see a tighter margin here or a tight kind of gross margin idea. Again, buying live, live cattle, selling the wholesale beef and the drop credit to calculate this sort of gross idea of, of some returns. So again, it gives you a notion that this is you know, it is is quite a bit tighter, squeezed quite a bit more than than we have been in the last several years, and certainly since, heck, since the pandemic, when we talked about record high uh, uh, live to cutout spread, uh, which has driven a lot of notions about adding packing capacity, building more plants, we certainly have much tighter spreads now. Let me jump to the retail beef price. The, the, the last month's data came out last week with the CPI. We have retail beef prices just slightly below a year ago, you know, a little higher than February, a little higher than January. Uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things here is one reason we see these retail prices continuing to stay like this is that we continue to have demand for beef. Uh, folks are still buying. Now, if we dug in a little more and looked at some of the USDA weekly data on retail featuring, we actually see quite a bit of featuring going on. By that, I mean grocery stores running some kind of specials on beef. Uh, and, and those specials aren't really captured in that, in, in this, this retail price data. So we have, some, I think, some interesting things going on where the kind of the nameplate retail price is still here but we see some more specials and features going on that mean the that may mean for some beef items the price consumers actually pay is is less. So with that uh, that retail beef price, we don't very often talk about sort of the cutout to retail, which implies sort of a grocery store margin. We often you know we just don't talk about that very much, but historically that cut out to retail value is, is historically large. We actually have seen some increases here as, as, you know, over the last month or so with some increase in the cutout value, flat retail prices touch lower than they were a year ago, and we've got that margin beginning to come down. One of the things I would suggest is that as we see cattle prices increase, as we see beef production decline and, and supplies become tighter and tighter. One of the areas I think we'll see this is that this margin shrinks some more, that 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 they that they lose some margin in the meat case. Uh, let me go back to that retail price idea. You know, one of the things that you know was really out there on the horizon and I believe is the big uncertainty in the marketplace is simply consumers' ability to pay for beef. How much are they going to be willing to pay if their if their wallets continue to get tighter? You know, will we begin to see some pullback from consumers buying less beef, which drives this retail price down? And so far, we sure haven't seen much of that. So I think the where where we'll be talking about headed in the future, if if we're unable, if if retailers are unable to raise those beef prices as supplies tighten, uh, then their margin is going to be cut. Uh, continue to be cut some more as we go through the year. And I think I got one more, and that's just uh, sometimes we talk about what's the value of that Fed steer as a percent of the retail price. 
So we're really looking at fed cattle price uh, relative to the retail value. How much is the producer getting? Well, we're almost back up to 50%. Um, that's about the highest it's been since, gosh, we've got to go back to 2017. We're pretty close here in 18. Uh, what you see is quite a bit of seasonal variation within the year as fed cattle prices go up and down. But again, as supplies tighten, uh, I think we're going to continue to see producers get a larger share of that retail uh, beef value. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we don't use those very these charts very much, but cer certainly that implied sort of ghost grocery store retail meat case margin. So I thought that was worth pointing out today. So, um, heck, record high prices. It's always fun to talk about that. So that is my last slide. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to end the show and maybe and uh, see if I can stop sharing the screen. There we go. Excellent. Cool. David, thank you very much. Great presentation. I will stop recording. If you all have any questions for David or Mark or John, you know, I might.